Welcome to the Web Platform Podcast, a developer discussion that dives deep into all things web. We discuss topics relevant to developing for the modern web and the web platform of today, tomorrow, and beyond. Welcome to the Web Platform Podcast, episode 104, Rail and Web Performance. Today in our panel, we have Justin Ribeiro. Hello, wonderful people. And myself, Eric Isaacson. And our special awesome guest today is the one and only Arrow Twist, Paul Lewis. Yay! Hello. Hi. Oh, it's, when everybody, the thing is, when people do their introductions, typically, it, 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 like Americans, you sound amazing. You sound like you're kind of born to host podcasts to me. Whereas I kind of answer and I go, oh, uh, yeah, mm, uh, hi, yeah, great, okay, mm, yeah. And I just sound like a really, really bad Hugh Grant impersonator to me. And I just, ah, oh dear, what a shame. There we go. Well, for but hi, all the same. I, I, I thought for sure Eric forgot your name. He, he said Arrow Twist, and I was like, oh, it's over. We've, we've, we've <laughs> moved up immediately out of the gate. Restart. That's just his hacker name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's because there are some very famous Paul Lewises, um, it turns out. And so on the hunt for a domain name, like, it was a good number of years ago now, I was just like, there's nothing left. And then I was just like, ah, no, ah. And it was like available, and I was like, <laughs> so that's pretty much that's. It was genuinely like half an hour one afternoon, and then it just kind of stuck, and now it won't go away. So there we are. But domain names are so interesting now. There are so many TLDs. Like you can just be anyone you want to be. <laughs> I can be an entire city. Yeah, I can be Justin that city, and I have registered that. Really? No, no, I have not registered that. Someone register that. Put my face in there and ginormous thing. It'd be great. Yeah. I feel like we've gotten off track already. We're three minutes in. <laughs> so, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the awesomeness of the um, of the Googles and the the team over with Web Performance that uh, that you're working on now, um, Mr. Lewis, <laughs> um, there's some. You guys are doing some really interesting patterns and interesting work there. And one of the things that I was looking at coming uh, coming off the videos for for IO and hearing about Rail, and I'd heard about that before. And Purple, obviously, through Polymer and these other these other uh, frameworks to get speed for our applications. So, um, do you want to? I sort of gave it a little intro for you, but do you want to like fix my intro and? And say it the way it's supposed to be. I don't know the way it's supposed to be, which sounds probably a little bit odd. Um, I think uh, I, if you wind the clock back about I don't know eighteen months, maybe a little bit longer. I don't know. Um, we were trying, all been trying to, and we still are, I think. And when I say we, I think as a community, we're still trying to figure out what does it mean to actually be fast in a way that like it actually means something to the person sat at their computer or their phone. And people would obsess over strange metrics. Uh, to me, anyway, they would say, the size of my JavaScript library is this, or um, uh, let me think of another one. Oh, my, my DOM content loaded file at this point. And I would look at those, and I think everybody in the team would look at those and go, well, you can tell me the size of your JavaScript library, but uh, what connectivity do you have? Like, if you're on a really good home connection, that's very different, whatever. And so the idea, certainly of Rail, first and foremost, was like, OK, look, take a step back. Imagine you're a person. That's OK. I can do that bit. Um, and try and kind of separate out what the expectations are for just getting something onto screen and, and using it. So for example, uh, say I'm on my search results and I click on a link. And it's got to load. So that's something I expect to do. And I have expectations of what that should be like. Or then I, I'm in the app and I, and I tap on something. I expect to get a response. I always say. Um, one of the most frustrating things is when you tap a button, and then like a second later, it, it like changes state, and you're like, ah, because you tapped it a second time, thinking, oh, it didn't get the first one. And about 50 taps later, you're like, oh, you're just really laggy. Um, so we have these expectations, and what Rails is trying to do is it's trying to put actual numbers to those and say, for these discrete states in an app, these are what people perceive to be either instant or smooth or, or whatever it is that we're trying to appreciate. And the, the research behind it goes way back, like 50 years or something. And then you get into, OK, let's like say, for example, in the load bit, like the expectation is that something, if you want to keep somebody's train of thought solid, you've got like one 
uh, second, which is really tight. Um, then you started to get into the tactics of, okay, how do I actually deliver something inside a second? And that's where things like Service Worker comes in. That's where Purple comes in, in theory, is like, can I push stuff down? Can I use HTTP2? You're into the actual tactics now of trying to meet the rail goal, and that's just one area. And then a lot of my other stuff has been in, particularly in animations, I guess. So that's not, that's not the great, like, sales sort of pitch for it, but that's just kind of how it is. I think that rail is this kind of top level what do humans expect to perceive? And then underneath it's like, okay, but how do I actually meet their expectations across all these things? Like, how do I animate well? How do I respond quickly? How do I load well? And how do I make use of time when the person that is on the app isn't doing anything? And now I'm going to shut up because I'll probably talk for the next 30 minutes. That's uh, so why we brought you on, right? So, yeah. it's all good. Well, <laughs> you know, it's funny you mentioned, you know, button lag and this sort of horribleness that is clicking something in, oh, double-clicking it because it worked. I actually, true story, about 10 years ago, I, I, I was brought in, uh, or I was requested to come on a job, and uh, it was for an e-commerce platform thing, and they asked specifically for lag. Um, true story, uh, because this is how unethical some people are in the world. They're like, hey, can we make it so the button looks like it's, a, you know, you didn't click it? I'm like, why, why in the world would you do that to users? Well, we want to, you know, elicit that, you know, secondary order. And I'm like, that's a horrible thing to do to people. You should not do that ever. Please don't. Uh, and I didn't work for them. But, uh, you know, lag is a real, real problem, uh, just generally from a developer perspective. But there are also the unethical people out there, and it makes me sad inside. Like, this is a user-centric performance model. Like, it says on, I'm looking right at developers.google.com, right? And response, animation, idle, load, so rail. And in that, too, with the user experience, like to your point, Justin, you, you could have, though, a good user experience could be, you could be too fast for the user. So there is some, um, there is some need in some cases to, to not necessarily slow down, but to, to pause. All right? And, and I don't know if idle covers that in the rail model, but do you know what I'm talking about? There's certain expectations and perceived performance. So I think what, yeah, so what you're tapping into, I think it is an important thing, is what Rail isn't going to do is it's not going to fix, fix a bad design, and it's not going to fix bad user flows. You know, ultimately, if you are going to take somebody through like a 50-step journey, you could do all 50 steps quickly, but you still made somebody go through a 50-step journey. Or consequently, you, or alternatively, you could hide your buttons and make it an, you know, an unnavigable mess. But it might be a fast unnavigable mess, and so I think you still have to separate those two things out and saying, is our user journey correct? Are we understanding the people that are coming to us and the devices they have? And that's all really useful information that you can gather. And then what do we actually want them to be able to do? What, are we, what service are we providing? Those are good, really good questions. They're really high level. And then it's a case of, okay, what are their expectations of me? And that's where Rail comes in. That, those are their expectations of me from a purely a, kind of an experiential point of view. And now, how do I actually not only deliver the user journeys that I wanted to deliver, but do it in such a way that I meet their expectations of me? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, I'd probably lose people by the, the third step of 50 if I had something like that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but that is a really good point, to, to separate those concerns. So this is, this is not something that's going to fix bad user flows, to your point. The, the journey to get anyone to an endpoint that is not just the endpoint that you want to go to, but they, well, where they want to go to, right? Because it is, user-centric models, at the end of the day, should serve, should make users happy, right? If we're not making users happy, then, you know, why are we building stuff? That is exactly right, and I think it, it does take a lot of critical thinking. It takes a lot of experience as well, and it takes a fairly, uh, you've got to take a fairly stern approach sometimes. I know uh, in, a, in a former life, I worked um, in agencies, and you know, the kind of the classic lines of, can we make the logo bigger? Um, these, that's just like one of 20 or 30, but often you'd have like a room full of stakeholders and they represent like the different departments and they all want to be above the fold. And, you know, it's, it, I mean, we are kind of going off piste a little bit, I suppose, but it is, it is really very much a case of you're not here to peddle your own department, ideally. You're here because you're part of a whole, and that whole is in service of a user, a human doing a thing. 
um, whatever it is, whether it's shopping or it's listening to music or it's reading the news, whatever it is, you're here to help them do that. Um, and hopefully in that process, yes, your business flourishes and, and all the rest of it. But yeah, if you're not doing it for the, the people, um, it's it seems it's strange to me. And I, I, I do wonder about that sometimes about, um, it can be very difficult to sometimes, I find it difficult to remember that some days, let me put it that way. Um, because you can get so into the technology and so into the the new stuff or just trying to just trying to build a thing, just trying to get from nine to five or whatever. And then somebody kind of pulls you up and goes, Yes, but have you thought about the user journey? And you're like, No, I'm busy staring at why I have an SVG rendering bug. Uh, it's not featuring in my head at its exact moment. But that's a lot of developers though, right? I mean we all get into that mode where I must fix this thing that is driving me absolutely crazy, where, you know, you've got that render no. glitch, or you've got that thing. Oh, no, yeah, I know you don't do that at all. I've seen your stuff. I, <laughs> I know you spend, you're sitting there going, what are you, I'm like, what are you working on? And I'm like, I got this glitch. I'm like, really? Guilty. Yeah, Guilty. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. I mean, but it, you want to play with that stuff. <laughs> absolutely. There's, yeah, I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm in any way critical. I'm just saying that it's, you have these sort of top-down and bottom-up things that you've kind of got to meet in the middle, right? And the top-down is like, there are humans, there are people at the end of this chain, and then there's the bottom-up where you're like, okay, but I actually have to kind of make my routing work, and I have to try all this stuff and keep on top of my game and improve myself, and I, have, I've, I've, I don't even know how I feel about classes in JavaScript and all those things, you know? Yeah, I mean, performance in general, I think, has changed um, on the web quite a lot. I mean, why, why is it, it's gonna, it sounds kind of silly, but why is it so important today more than ever? I mean, the browsers have gotten better. Um, the page loads, you know, at the, at the end of the day, it's going to eventually load. I mean, you brought up something earlier about uh, different kinds of connections. Like, why, why is it so, so important today? I think we seem to have broken Moore's Law, I think, is how I kind of think of it, which is we were going faster, 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 and faster, and faster, and then we introduced a whole new form factor that in smartphones that turned out to be incredibly popular and opened up a whole new class of connection because before that we hadn't really sort of seen this widespread use of 2G and then 3G and then 4G until smartphones. They just It wasn't a thing. It was just like you've got your broadband, your cable into your home, and that was kind of how it was. And when we introduced these constraints devices, all of a sudden, all the things that we kind of assumed were going to get faster and faster and faster, they didn't. They got so much slower. And there's a sort of big scramble to kind of understand what that means. And we had the kind of the mobile-only sites and all this kind of stuff. Um, and so I think that that's why it matters is that there's a whole raft of people now who are coming online for the very first time and for whom their primary device is their phone. And they've never, um, you know, the, the first experience they're going to have of the thing that you've built is through their phone, and possibly the only experience they're going to have. And it's not just on their phone, but it's going to be their phone on a 2G or a 3G connection. And the question is, how well prepared are you for that? And thinking forward again, it would be a mistake for us to go think, I think, that smartphones are going to get perpetually faster and we're not going to find a new form factor again. But there's not to say we are or we aren't. I'm just saying that it becomes very difficult to kind of predict one way or the other. I think we've shown ourselves that. So it's about being sort of um, future friendly, I think is probably the, the appropriate term. And just recognizing this. When I said earlier, you know, you can look at wh where your, um, what devices people are coming to you on. I think that's really useful. Look at the devices, uh, look at the, um, where in the world they are. And if they're all on a super fast smartphone, and a really good connection, or they're all on desktop on a really fast connection, where well, you can make decisions based on that. Although, that could be a self-fulfilling kind of prophecy there, because you'd be like, oh, all my users are on fast connections. It's like, only the people on fast connections can get to your thing. Um, so, no, that's, well, you're, lots you're of stuff in there. Right. That's a dangerous game. That, that's a very dangerous game to play when it comes down, you know, especially if you're built on, building a business of any, of any sort. Hey, look! All my users are here. That's where all my users will ever be. Um, that's probably not the case. <laughs> but no. you uh, should know these things because otherwise, how would you how would you how would you improve your performance? Because there is a lot to be said about 
uh, performance metrics across the board and tr actually tracking that yourself. I mean, we talk a lot about, you know, we can talk a lot about Rail and sort of its focus on user and sort of the metrics that, you know, you try to hit, right? You want 60 FPS. You, you want to have that smooth, jank-free, very nice user interaction experience. But if you're not actually capturing some metrics, if you're not using the timings API and user timings API and things like that, that's a hard thing to do. But we have new tools that make it nicer now. Was yes, that about do. the time that, uh, you know, when, when the mobile boom of uh, traffic started getting higher and higher, is that, is that kind of how Rail came about? You guys started thinking about that? Or did it, what's the story behind how it started? It was, uh, it came from um, uh, Dmitry Glaskov, actually, who... Um, Godfather of web components. Yes, indeed, uh, and a lovely man to boot. And he, uh, I, he, I think he was just thinking this thing through, and it, he, he was, he sort of identified these different phases of of an app's life cycle, and then he started to fit in what he understood about research and so on, and it just sort of it settled itself down. I, I think it was one of these things that it, it, we iterated and evolved a while, and then Paul Irish and I wrote up the article for Smashing Mag, and to some degree, we there was there's kind of nothing more to say. Some people kind of go, "Well, has has rail been superseded?" And I'm like, "Well, not unless human perception's been superseded, um, because it's just at this point, it's about the what are humans' expectations are." So I think it was more a case of trying to frame the problem in that way rather than about a partic particular technology or a particular implementation. I think one of the shifts that we've um, that I've got actually personally at the moment and have had over the last, I'd say, six to 12 months, and I think Rail is a part of that, is caring about outcomes more than the means a little bit. So when people kind of uh, say, should I be using vanilla? Should I be using Polymer? Should I be using Ember React? Should I be server-side rendering, blah, blah, blah? I, I've started to kind of go, well, do what gives you, makes you able, do whatever allows you to meet your expectations on the user side. And if for you, it's a case of, like, if I server-side render, that seems to cut my load time down. Um, and I can't server-side render with this particular technology choice. And I say, well, that, that kind of forces your hand, right? Um, but it's like, uh, it, it was kind of work back from those, from those goals. And if you can achieve it with a 1,000 connections on 2G, um, and a, a million resources, you can't. But if you could, then great, do that if that's going to work for you, um, as long as you meet the outcome. And I think um, one of the shifts I would love to see, and that isn't quite there yet, in, at least in my view, is that uh, I'd love to see frameworks and libraries not necessarily computing on things like how many kilobytes they are gzipped, but how well they enable particular outcomes. Um, and not just for the developer, but for the for the people at the end of the chain. So it's not a case of ah, here's you know we give you this particular way of constructing your your app because that is important. And I don't want to sound like I don't think that's important, but I tend to think that's almost a given. We've got so many options these days, but how well are you going to help me get my stuff on screen quickly? Not spend forever like booting up the JavaScript on the phone, uh, letting me you know. Uh, prioritize stuff to happen in the background or on a different thread, you know, these these things that you have to kind of pass off to a framework or whatever you build yourself. Uh, I don't think that we're at a point yet as a community and as an industry where we focus on those things. We don't focus on performance outcomes. We tend to fo focus on uh, things that we feel like we can measure more easily, like file size or, you know, how well it bundles with Webpack or Rollup or whatever. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, numbers don't lie, but they're not always the answer as far as, like, gathering metrics. Well, in time yeah. to interaction, I mean, you know, that's, to some extent, I mean, that, that can be a very difficult thing to sort of gauge, right? You can gauge boot up time in your JavaScript, um, but depending on how you actually piece it together in your pattern of things, how quickly is, you know, how fast does it render out and how interactable is that site? May not be at the end of that spin up. You don't know. Um, you need to measure those things. And those are, to your point, I mean, these are sort of the newer things to think about as you start to develop out.
Because it is, I mean, to some extent, there's so many frameworks now. Like, you know, everyone wants to argue about frameworks. Uh, and I'm not a big argue about frameworks person because if it works for you, it works for you. At the end of the day, is your user happy? I'm all about user happiness. And I, you know, I preach it a lot, particularly here on the podcast, but to basically anyone who will listen to me give a talk. So, you know, user happiness, you know, I, it cannot be discounted. It is very important. And if you have to come up with new ways to measure, to find the things that work for your tools to be able to create that happiness, then you should probably think about doing that. I think you've got to go back to the user flow stuff as well. Like, if you've done your user flows well, you know what the interaction is that you're looking for, right? It's like, do they click on the big fat buy button or the subscribe button or the whatever button it is, or you know, do they scroll, maybe that's the thing that you're looking to do and they, there's ad visibility. Like every, anybody who does their user flows or at least understands the nature of what it is has these business metrics. They probably have business people who are saying, we care about the number of people who convert from this to that. And so Again, you can step back from that and say, well, how well do they kind of coincide with what the people who are coming to us want to do? And how do we actually realistically measure those things? Like, uh, can we prioritize rendering of that button and that piece of text because those are the things need to see? And then after that, we can be a bit more kind of relaxed and a bit lazier about kind of, uh, lazy in the good way, about getting all this other stuff on screen. But again, it kind of comes back to, like you said, the user happiness and also what are the things that your business needs to succeed and those are the things that I'm actually going to prioritize. And uh, I, it's, it, it, that's very high level. And then you get down into the, the, the nuts and bolts of, okay, what does it actually mean to tweak this and do that? And the permutation stuff is really hard. I should say that. So you're sort of going, okay, but if I switch on H2 push, um, what do we push? When do we push it? Um, you know, how do we know that that thing worked? And that's probably where the, the, the cutting edge stuff is at the moment. And they said there's the, the time to interaction is something that is very much top of mind for, uh, for me at, at the moment. It's like, it's no good if you render something. I called it the uncanny valley. I did this, this little graphic a while ago where um, I see this a lot. So there's the one where something takes forever. It's just a white screen forever. And then pop, everything comes in. And you're like, now you can interact. Ta-da! It's like the kind of the magician pulling away the cloth. And then there's the other one, which I call the Uncanny Valley, which is the middle ground where you kind of get this nice, fast first render. And then you, you interact. And it goes, huh, lol, no, get in. You can't actually click this, because if you click this, nothing's going to happen. I'm just going to ignore you. And that, that's, that can be as frustrating as anything. It's like, did you work? Did you not work? I, if. And then the final one, which is a pattern I think is more resilient and friendlier, is to kind of try and be strategic and just get things booted up as quickly as you can piecemeal. Um, but it often requires a lot of advanced thinking about sending down CSS to make sure things don't pop around the screen and move. Like, I have to reserve the space for my header, but I'm not going to make my header functional until later but I have to make room for the masthead as well and, and all those kinds of things. So it's not easy, um, but I, I, I think it's, it's definitely worth doing, personally. I mean, HTTP2, too, you brought up, and that's something that I've been wanting to, to migrate to just because of the latency that you get from the smaller, you know, the latency advantages that you get, um, in addition to the, to the download. But it's, it's not an easy thing to do if you have existing applications um, I've seen uh, some demos where they try and fall back, like on the, the Polymer Shop demo, uh, to a different type of, you know, HTTP 1 versus HTTP 2. Because if you're dealing with a living piece of software, um, it's really hard to, to figure out um, a strategy, I think, for, for performance. Because, you know, you could say, I need, I need, like, I need to render everything 60 frames per second. I need all this, the, the 100 millisecond thing that we were talking about earlier. But... I think I think getting relative measures and figuring out how does this affect the business goals is really really important. How do you recommend taking like legacy, legacy applications and sort of um, you know doing a performance audit and uh, attacking this with some kind of strategy? That's yeah. So that's going to be dependent on the business itself and the goals. But I think there one of the things that I think you can try pretty quickly is. Uh, putting your stuff via a CDN that supports HTTP2. 
um, and give that a whirl, even just as a kind of an A-B testing. So assuming you've got some folks on, you've got everybody on HTTPS, for example, but some people on HTTP 1, some people on H2, um, you might be able to A-B across to either your existing H1 stuff and then some of your audience onto H2 and just see what the, the stats are like in terms of, you know, as I say, the, well, I haven't said, but I think it's, you know, what are those metrics that you're actually interested in? Like, when do those buttons show up and that kind of stuff, if that's what you want to test. If you want just a, a plain old test, you could look at something like speed, uh, speed index on web page test, and you could, again, you could set it up so you run a, a battery of tests, like 10 of those on 3G, on a, a Nexus 5 or something like that from web page test from somewhere in the world and say, look, I want 10 to go to my HTTP 1. I want 10 to go to H2. But I think, and, and you could you can construct situations where that would work out. And certainly for me, so I put my stuff onto, um, onto a CDN and it, it switched on H2 for me automatically. Um, I still serve up my, all my stuff with H1, expecting HTTP 1 as in its one big CSS file. It's not big, it's my own site, it's not massive. But I don't, I don't make sort of any kind of assumption at this point that uh, I'm going to send, you know, 20 individual files. So that we do, you're right, we do have this un, unusual kind of crossover point where somebody goes, right, what do I do? Because on the one hand, I want to unbundle everything now, and I want to send individual files. I get all the cacheability. I don't pay per connection anymore. But what if somebody does come to me on HTTP 1? Now what do I do? And the only solution I've come up with, which is eh, not bad, it's also not going to be the best, is that you run your build twice. One would just be like, copy the files. The other one would be, how about we copy the files and bundle them together like we used to do? And then uh, HTTP one, or sorry, browsers will send an upgrade header saying, I can do HTTP 2 if you're interested. And you could look for that on the server side and go, oh, cool, got a H2 person here. Let's send them off to, like, serve them up this one and then leave the H1, HTTP 1 people where they are. Does that make sense? It's a very convoluted answer. Well, it was a convoluted question, so. It was, uh, <laughs> you know, like if I send a request header, you're basically saying that, that the request will have, hey, I, I have an upgrade uh, ability. So the request will, will, will add that automatically, or you have to add that with, with your uh, headers object? No, it should be, as far as I know, I think the browser does it for you. And part of the initial connection, it says, I can handle HTTP2 just on the off chance that you can send it. And the server can be like, <laughs> I don't know, what's this header? Or it can be like, yes, I do. To stuff and start doing, start doing whatever it is I need to do. On your server side, you'd actually have to specifically look for that header and kind of split your audience based on that. So it starts to get very into kind of DevOpsy and again, what is the state of your existing server side setup? Like, can it, you know, do you run it yourself? If it, have you gone serverless and, and and using somebody else's stuff? You know, there's lots of questions that I think an individual company or an individual team or a person would have to look at there and say, yeah, we can go down that path. But you're right, it's certainly not easy, and I certainly think it's um, it's something that we, again, as an industry, need to figure out some of our practices for. We don't want everybody to have to go back and be like, okay, brand new build time. Um, that's not realistic for many people. Um, but there is a sense in which we are at a, a point where some of these things are big changes for us, like shifting people onto HTTPS is a big change. Shifting people into thinking about HTTP2 is a big change. Shifting people to implement service worker, these are big changes. But they're big changes with big benefits. That's the, the thing to remember. But often, and going back to what we were saying before, it's, it can be very difficult to remember the benefits when they don't impact you and your day directly. The cost does as a developer, doesn't it? Because you're the one who's got to think about how do we actually structure our application in this brave new world? What do we pass to the service worker? What don't we? What do we do as H2? What don't we? Whereas the benefits are more softly felt, possibly, unless you you happen to be like a, a freelancer or an individual business owner or that kind of thing. Often it's, well, the customers seem happier, which is good. Um, but I haven't spoken to those people in a while, so. Well, things like Service Worker, too, like, it falls back gracefully, right? It has progressive enhancement. 
So that's great. Like, because then if a user comes on IE nine or eight or something, God help them eight, then you know, then they'll they'll be, you know, they won't be screwed. They'll be able to to kind of look at this and say, okay, there's something that's here. Whereas, um, you know, if there's certain there's certain features that if you implement, like I fear if I if I do the HTTP HTTP two, that uh, someone on IE nine or eight would be totally screwed. But it sounds like it's not the case. Uh, where if you serve everything as HTTP one, but still have that, you'll have to do something at the networking level level for that though. Yeah, if I understand it correctly, it should be the server side where you can look at the incoming request, look for the header, okay. and then decide how you respond rather than just saying, I'm going to pull the file. You might say, yeah, instead of pulling it from there, HTTP one chunk, pull it over here. So when they ask for like the, the, the root, you could be like, okay, I'll give you the I'll give you the HT H two index rather than the HTTP one index. Uh, your point about service worker is a really important one. Um, it is a little bit off the, of the beaten track, I suppose, but the progressive, well, progressive everything actually is kind of very much where my head's at these days, progressive rendering, as in you don't have to draw everything on to screen at once. Like we're, we're used to a fairly streamingy web um, where, and we should, I think, embrace that. There's nothing wrong with saying I don't have everything up front, but here's what I do have. Um, and of course you want to get, if you could, you'd get everything up on screen at once. But if you prioritize things and, and you get the thing that the person wanted up, up front, I think they're going to be more forgiving than having to hold a, a blank screen to be like, ta-da. And then you've got the progressive bootstrapping, which I was talking about before, which I think is really important as well. Like, you don't have to send all that JavaScript down at once. You know, you could send down just the little bit that you need and then send more later on when things have settled down. Because if they, you don't need the comments straight away, perhaps, unless your whole thing is about comments, your whole site, in which case you probably do need the comments. But for most situations, you can imagine that like, something like comments is not like, must have it now. I don't um, know that comments are ever really needed on the internet anymore. Like, <laughs> it's just, you know, I've, I've you, run a lot of streams. I mean... <laughs> well, all those, uh, I'm sorry, all those comment directories, you know, from Angular 1 that are out there. Well, you turn <laughs> you turn a comment into an Angular directive. No, I've never seen that. Yeah, good time. <laughs> I don't understand uh, the world, Eric. I don't. <laughs> I, like I feel like I should pull you out there. <laughs> pull you to a part quickly. Um, yeah, it's a progressive rendering, progressive bootstrapping, and progressive enhancement as well. The three progressives, if there aren't any more. Uh, you know, you don't have to, like you say, you want to be very tactical about kind of that route up for people and be very cautious about, you know, uh, Bruce Lawson does a really, really good talk. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it. It's the it's the uh, World Wide Web, not the Wealthy Westerners Web. And he, he's talking about how the, the, the web is a resource for everybody. And and I think, I think performance plays into that very strongly that... Um, in, in, and all the progressive stuff plays into that very well about saying, like, what is it that you really need? That's the thing I'll prioritize, and then I'll build up from there. And hopefully, yeah, hopefully you, you're fortunate enough to get somebody with a really great computer on a really fat connection, and that's just high fives, and they, you know, they, they buy your stuff, and that's brilliant. But if not, you, know, you want to be sort of thinking, okay, what's the worst case scenario? The worst case scenario is somebody comes to me with a patchy 2G connection on a, on a fairly old phone. Now what do I do? And if you can look at it in that sort of situation with that kind of head-on, then the person who comes to you with a really amazing phone or the really amazing computer, they're going to be like, that was blazingly fast. That was worryingly fast. I did not appreciate the web could be that fast. So if you solve it for that low end and make it acceptable, that's going to be blazing fast at the other end. Well, and the, tool, the tooling's gotten better. You look at Chrome, for instance, right? I mean, we have network th throttling in Chrome now. We have, you know, DevTools has really sort of expanded to sort of help help with that story. Because I think one of the issues was for a lot of web developers who were sort of building for the best performance, the best case scenario, you've got a, you know, you've got a Xeon scores of RAM and, you know, fiber. The you tooling's a little bit... Worst case, though, right? <laughs> No, no, well, that's the kicker, is that I think that the tooling has gotten better so that you you don't necessarily have to have every device known to mankind to test against. I mean, I have four right. devices that sit on my desk on a daily basis, and they're all mid-tier, 
you know, they're not high-end phones. There's stuff that, I mean, I got a prepaid phone I paid 15 bucks for, the corner market, that I test on that has Chrome and some very weird variant of Android, right? There's those sort of devices that live in the world, and it's nice to test on device, and you should test on device if you can, but the tooling has gotten better to sort of help the story where you do need to look beyond just the thing on your desktop as the end-all, be-all sort of boot-up procedure for your web application. We do it all the time as web app, app de- as app developers, right? Where we're we're building these these applications, but we only test it in Chrome, right? And then you pass it off, and hopefully you have QA who will test all these other things. You know, I I make it a point to test on on all the platforms that I can, you know, and but you can't get everything to your point. But we should make a much better effort as web developers to to test at on like you know, your, your lowest common denominator. Um, I think you, you've both made uh, absolutely brilliant points. Firstly, I think, uh, just your, your point about um, testing on device, it, uh, that's the only way you're going to find out. I, you know, the, you can put on the, because DevTools, there's like, you know, loads of options there for helping you figure out how this thing's going to potentially be on a phone, but it's only when you actually put it on a phone. So I had this... I had this situation the other day where um, I was doing a blur filter, and uh, it was fine on my desktop uh, because it turns out my or my laptop because my laptop turns out has a really good GPU on it, and uh, the blur filters are applied on the GPU late on in the process, and so it's like this post-processing step, and it was only when I actually plugged in my phone. And went to it and went, wow, that's not what I expected. This is really slow. That forced me into like finding another way to solve this, this problem. And there's just no substitute for actually jamming in a phone and going, okay, not only does this kind of perform well or not well, um, but also how are my user flows doing? Like is this, did, when I tap that button, do I get the, the like there's the um, the tap outlines as well. You know, is it, the things that a browser UI, even when you're in like the the mobile emulation modes, like they don't show you some of the funny things that get added to people's uh, phones. And again, only plugging them in is the only way you're going to find out. And it, I think you've got to, rather than kind of taking this fairly all-embracing view, I think you've got to be. I I feel like it's worth being pragmatic and saying I need to know what roughly what class of devices my users are on, and those are the kind of devices I will stock up on, and maybe a couple below as well if I can. Like, or I'm going to get a really a weak phone, an old one, I'm going to get a mid-tier, good, and I'm going to get top-end one, and, like, just divide and conquer. Some people go all in and get, like, a device lab, and if you can do that, that's amazing. Not everybody can do that. Um, and it is great, and we are trying to get as much of that kind of stuff into Chrome as we can, but, you know, I mean... As, as with anything, just shove it, you know, plug in a phone. And then the other thing, the oh yeah, tap, yeah the, the other thing you said Eric, was about um, kind of, you know, you can't test on everything all the time, and that's true. You you just simply can't. I think you've got to be you've got to be tactical about what you try and test on, and hopefully you pick devices that are representative of the the ones that your people, you know, your users are using. Otherwise, you're optimizing for the wrong thing, right? Because you're kind of going, it works amazingly on 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 this phone over here. Maybe, maybe what we do is we suggest that they buy one of those phones. Mm. Which isn't a way to handle anybody, really. Works on the Tor browser. And come on. Hmm. It's getting really dark here. The United Kingdom, it turns out, is quite a few hours behind. Or ahead, sorry. Ahead, we're ahead. I'm going to go and turn on the light. Give me a moment. While well, Paul is away. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear a message from our sponsor. <laughs> no. Ever the professional. <laughs> you were you're basked in just beautiful glow. You know, the, the, I, the, the great sun you know, got that great sun setting light. It's more, dream. I know, and the thing is with a shiny head, I'm a photographer's nightmare. <laughs> um, yeah. When we when we when we when we film at work, um, like we do supercharged and uh, HTP two or three of those kind of things that we don't they have like this powder, and they they get this powder, and they 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 dab my head to to de shine my head, 
because no amount of lighting is going to stop this from being a, like, oh, look how bald this is. There's no way of getting around that. So they're just like, they, they map me down, as it were. It's like, yep, yeah, no gotta shine. Got to put a base on. Yep, got to put a base on. You can't have shine. You can't have shine on camera. No, um, I, I've learned more. I, I've, I've learned more about kind of um, de shining my face than I ever thought I would actually need um, in a in a career in web development. So, you know, if I've got if I'm if I'm helping by putting some kind of glow on screen, that's just my gift to the internet today. I've goodness knows I've cost it enough. In fact, somebody I think somebody on one of the the talks I did, the only comment they left on YouTube was. And he's got a shiny head. <laughs> that's, that's all they put. I was like, don't worry about the content of the talk. Don't worry about whether it helps or doesn't help. Any feedback is good, but no. My, he's got a shiny head. And I watched it, and I thought, <laughs> they're right. You know what? They're really, they're right. Well, you know, that's the only that. takeaway. <laughs> there, there are problems. That person did not grasp. The, you know the, the the magnitude of what you were speaking about, or they just have a really you know they really get directed to shiny things. I mean, some people you know it's the internet, it's shiny things. Maybe it was a magpie. Maybe you just tapped out the response. <laughs> I don't Man, know. Those magpies are smarter. I I I'm not going to deny that. You know, they're just they are on the internet. And are we you know are we you know mapping our magpie performance? That's the question we need to be asking ourselves. We really have strayed from our topic very well. Yes, we have. <laughs> so, as far as performance goes, <clears throat> I was talking uh, on, I was chatting on Twitter and getting angry as I usually do on Twitter. So, but, a normal Twitter day then. Yeah, a normal Twitter day. Um, no, actually, it was. I didn't get angry, but but there was there was a tweet on there, and I won't say who it was, but they were talking about HTML imports, and you know they were saying, oh, it's it's going to be a nightmare because then you have another hundred, you know, a hundred imports, and then you have a problem, and and that's that's why imports suck. HTML imports, pretty much. I forget what the exact tweet was, but but I responded. I was like, you know, you're going to have the same problem with um, JavaScript modules too, and this is another reason to move towards that um, that duplex model that HTTP2 has. With H, you know, I I think that those assets will definitely um, be served better by that sort of thing, but it still doesn't stop the like, like it made me think of the user flow too. It doesn't stop it. It doesn't stop you from doing uh, bad things like having a hundred imports listed on your page. Well, that's not really maintainable either. So how do we kind of look at at performance long term for something like that? I think um, part of it's a tooling problem, or a large part of it is probably a tooling problem, in that. It's going to get to the point where we have so many resources that it becomes unwieldy to manage those ourselves. Um, so uh, I think another example of this is with service workers. Right, when you get to the service worker install step, and you're like, "Here's all the things that I want to be, you know, uh, cached for offline," and you get to anything that's a, a, even a medium-sized app, and that list is just incredibly long. And where's that list going to come from? You know, somebody going to sit there and you know type all of those out and be like, oh no, uh, we just made a whole new raft of images, right? I better go back and rewrite that whole list. Well, of course, it doesn't take very long, I think, before somebody goes, you know what? We should have something that just kind of globs our whole build folder and then starts to kind of build these lists for us automatically. And I I wonder whether when it comes to the JavaScript modules and HTML imports, and I agree, I think they're very related, those two. In fact, all three probably are fairly well related. Um, we just need, we need something that not only can catalog for us, but something that's actually hopefully smart enough to kind of say, okay, when they come to the home page, this is the stuff they need, and like can, can start to build those dependency trees for us, because, you know, I, I actually kind of like this when, um, when I work with something like it's Babel, isn't it? I always say Babel because um, that's just how I am. Babel, if you do import star from whatever or import thing from whatever, um, because of the way that browser refine all that works, like it starts to actually manage all that for you. It doesn't. It doesn't 
get grumpy about the order in which, and okay, it's making one one big bundle at the end, but it feels like it's the next step on from there that it can kind of go, ah, I know you need that then, so that means I need to put that there first and so on. And I think we have to make it a technology problem more than a, a human problem because it's not going to get any easier. In fact, instead of just bundling everything together, what we're saying is actually we go back to what we used to have, which is one file does one job. But the things that we're now trying to make, well, they don't just require 10 files and, uh, you know, at worst, they're requiring hundreds if not thousands of files. Um, and it's a case of we don't want to necessarily just go, well, everything's its own individual file because we also know from the early... So some people have done some research on this, and I forget who it was, so they'll have to forgive me, but they basically came back and went, we tried, we tried it out where we basically sent 300 individual file, files over HTTP2. Turns out, not as good as bundling them all up into one big file. And we all went, oh. So it's not quite as clear-cut as we thought it was. So I think, basically, so it's two parts. One, we don't know, but two, I think we need tools that help us figure out how to bundle things properly because I don't think it's a, a problem that's going to be very easy for a person to manage you know, day after day after day. Yeah, it doesn't sound like it's an easy problem to solve for sure. Uh, I mean, it makes me think too, like uh, Steel.js is kind of like a similar similar type of thing that, uh, you know, that Babel is. Um, and if I may be misspeaking, but they have this whole, this whole idea of they'll have a couple of different... Um, like they'll they'll optimize based on static analysis of the application. They'll look at and say, well, you're using jQuery on this many pages, and you're using this library on this many pages. We're going to put these together, right? And so it would actually create maybe three three bundles, four bundles, something like that, based on usage, right? And then you you'd have your own caching strategy. And I don't know if that's a a full answer, but I think people are thinking about this. Is what what I'm getting to. Yeah, we're seeing tree shaking all over the place as well, aren't we? And I think we have to kind of go back to well, why does any of this matter? It's because ultimately it means you can't get stuff down the wire fast enough, right? Um, or you can't reliably do so. If you knew, for example, that... I mean, there are loads of options. Let me just enumerate one that comes to mind. You could, on your initial delivery, um, send down, say, three or four bundles you could then split those out into individual files and store them in the cache, say, via a service worker. So you could actually kind of send down a package, which you then split out, and then you cache individual files. And then when you update your application, you only update the items that have actually changed. right? So you do almost like individual file diffs as part of the kind of upgrade, um, rather than saying, well, on my initial visit, I'm going to send you 200 files. You actually say, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you four files, and I'm going to send them in priority order, and then as each one comes, they kind of get unpacked into their original files again to be stored in the cache. And that's yeah. one option. I mean, I think basically what I'm saying is there are patterns that we haven't yet thought of, and it's really good that, that I haven't heard of Steel Jess. Um, it's uh, not as popular as the other ones, for sure. But you're right, though there are people thinking about this problem, and I don't think it's a new problem. I think um, one of the things that's really interesting to me is um, having done other programming before the web, some things that uh, are sort of only bubbling to the surface now for the web have been long-standing and solved issues in other areas of computing, um, and we just have to find our own flavor of them, our own variant on them, because our, our, our platform isn't necessarily the same as those, but it's it's a it's been a long-standing solution in some areas to sort of handle dependency management, for example, you know, as far back as we've had linkers and things like that. So um, it's about how do we actually do that today for the web, rather than having to necessarily think up everything ourselves. And like you, you said earlier too, with progressive enhancement, and then there's progressive, you know, I forgot the terms you use because I haven't heard of it broken down that way. Um, but but. My, I guess what I'm getting to is like service worker, for instance, progressive enhancement. But even even that, if you're relying on something so core, like for instance, if I wanted to get information on the user agent, and service worker has that information before the page loads, and then I want to say, okay, Babel, you're going to run inside a service worker now. You're going to compile the assets that I need exactly for this particular user agent. Like you can't really depend on something like that because I, I think I think what that means is. Today, 
like your example is a great example of, okay, if it doesn't work, fine, we'll fall back to the other thing. But if I had this particular strategy, the fallback is like, oh, well, now I have to really think about this. Once it's all in the browsers and Service Worker is everywhere, then yeah, but that won't, you know, we really couldn't trust that for several years from now before we can and focus even, on that. Even then, I would strongly suggest that we didn't because um, the first visit somebody makes to your site, they don't have a service worker. And right. that might be how they make a, a value judgment on the thing that you're giving to them. They go, oh, well, this thing took 30 seconds to install. Be like, no, 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 come back the second time. It's really good the second time. Because I've yeah. made it so that when you come back the second time, it's really fast. You're like, yeah, but you didn't make the first one really good. And well, let me check it again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Seems fine at this end. Um, and so I think we we need to we always need to treat the service worker as this kind of this bonus stage kind of okay I'm hopefully getting fast enough I'm hopefully getting things working um, because there's a million and one reasons why I shouldn't rely on 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 that service worker being there even if it's a ubiquitous API, API at that point. Um, because, like I say, the first visit is not going to have a service worker, or it might be that they need to do a, a critical upgrade on something at some point, um, like in your app, for example, your app logic needs to update. There's a, there's a ton of reasons why you just want to be really cautious about that. But you, if it is there, you can hopefully then take it onto onto kind of a next level. And I think, yeah, the the, it's the progressive enhancement part of the, that story is really important and. I think because I know uh, the folks who worked on the spec, like even Jake and, and Alex Russell and, and the folks from uh, Mozilla as well, I think they've had progressive enhancement as this kind of core aspect of service workers in particular from day one. They didn't want it to be... Because um, one of the things that distinguishes the web, I think, from other, other delivery mechanisms is that we can give you stuff from the first network response. We can actually start, in theory, rendering things immediately. We don't make you go through a lengthy install step when you like when you used to put the CD into your computer and wait for it to like go through the whole installer process. And at the end, you could click on the icon and we like, -da -da -da. we don't have that for the web. I mean, it's, it's one of the web's killer features is I give you a URL and hopefully, as soon as the browser starts to get information, it can start putting stuff on screen and you can start playing. You can start working with this thing. You can start interacting with it. And if service workers were a kind of, hang on, got to install before we can go any further, um, that seems to me at least to undermine one of the great benefits of the web because you're putting in a roadblock into somebody's interaction now, um, which is just not fair on them, really. Well, and there, and there are initiatives around sort of, you know, you look at AMP. You know, and it's sort of service worker install step where the concept, particularly for news organizations, um, for delivering basically things very, very fast for that one second initial render where it will basically background load a service worker so that the first jump to the actual web app or PWA or whatever it may be could be initially faster than it might normally be. Um, you know, there are, there are quite a few sort of approaches to it now just to make the, the web generally faster. You know, I see, you know, between that and what we're just talking about. I mean, how do you, if you're a developer out there now, Paul, like, where do you start? Like, I mean, there are so many options in terms of I want to make that first sort of render fast. Um, is there a good place people should start when they start to look at rail and web performance and making their applications better? This, uh, this is uh, an interesting question, if only because I think it's now more than ever, um, there's a lot in there. If you're just getting started on the web, it's not as easy as it was, I think, when I got started on the web um, in about like, 2001, 2002, there or thereabouts. Now it's just like, hey, you can actually realistically do this in Notepad. Um, these days, no. You, like you say, we're overwhelmed with tools, with uh, options, and, and like, how do I even do do the basics? And I actually think that's that's something we need to to address generally. And I say we, I mean 
all of us, we have a propensity to over-tool, I think, and over, over-do it a little bit, um, which isn't always a popular sentiment. But I, if it were me, and I would start, I was starting now, I would say start with HTML, JavaScript, CSS. Um, understand how the browser understands those things. And I don't just mean at a functional level, like what is Flexbox. I mean also in the sense of what does it mean to actually send, like how does the browser receive that stuff and then do something with it? How does it actually parse the 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 CSS, like the fact that it's actually going to stop putting anything on screen until it's got to the bottom of that CSS? That that's the the thing you need to can you need to understand those building blocks first and foremost, and then you then from there you can understand how it is these tools are trying to fix individual problems and what what say for example Chrome like what DevTools is telling you with those individual things if you come at it from a, a solutions based kind of approach where um, you can go right well I I've got this very big setup and at the end of it I get spat out something that should work if any part of that process isn't optimized in the way that you think it is or you've assumed it is or you just don't even understand you're in a a difficult situation. Um, so I think it's about, I, I genuinely think it's about understanding the kind of the first principles and working up from there. What I would say is that I think that's also a position of privilege. Not everybody has the time in their day and not everybody has the, um, just the freedom to do those things. But I, I say if, you, if you're in a position where you are able to um, spend a bit of time and understand how browsers work, how the network works, how these, these core things work. It's like saying, I know how to get to the shops in my, or the stores in my local town, but I don't know anything about roads or traffic signals or anything. You know, there's a lot you can actually do there. And if you can, I think it's definitely worth from that. What I think it is, it is very difficult, and what I don't really, it's pretty difficult sometimes to look from the other end of the, of, the, uh, of history. You know, once you learn to drive, have you ever tried to go back to being a learner driver once once you've learned to drive? What is it? Uh, in the UK, it's very normal for people to to have gears rather than like be an automatic car. So one of the things we learn quite a lot over here is like changing gears. Once you've learned to change gears in a car, it's almost impossible to do a bad gear change. And so one of the things I think for us developers, it's really hard to have that empathy with. Oh, this person is just starting out. How can they not know about function scoping? How can they not know about you know, all these things, uh, things that we take for granted. So I think we have work to do there to kind of help people kind of 101 and 201 because many of us have been doing this for so long, um, I, I fear, that we've forgotten what it's like to be at 101 level. So I don't have all the answers. I just think um, I would start at the basics and work up from there rather than trying to go into the kind of the pro gear from day one. It's very um, hard. The other thing I would say, yeah, yeah it is. The, the, the other thing is I'd say get really familiar with uh, dev tools. Like your, the developer tools are like your best friend, um, and they can be really intimidating some, the, the first time you fire them up um, if you're not used to them. And like you, you load timeline, for example, in Chrome, and the first time you look at it, you're going, okay, why are all these horizontal blocks here? Do any of them want to hurt me? I, I, I don't even know what, what is a horizontal block. What? Ah. Uh, and you sort of panic, and then you go to the network tab, and then all of a sudden there's like these columns about, you know, what protocol something's used and what priority it had and what it had for breakfast this morning, and there are these headers, and you're like, what's a header? And it's it, there's just this wealth of information, and it, taking time to just kind of go from almost Hello World and going, okay, what does Hello World look like in DevTools? And what, what does layout mean? What does paint mean? But the, the information is out there, and if it isn't out there, I would love to know because I'd love to help figure out how we get that information to people because that's the thing that they're clearly missing. But I do think for a, certainly a lot of the stuff is out there. It's about piecing over time and just giving yourself a bit of room to do so. I'm going to shut up now. Now, I think one of the great tools that you built, actually, um, CSSTriggers.com, so, like, I think when you're first learning how to do CSS and HTML and JavaScript, it's it's probably not something you somewhere you want to go right away. But once you've been using it, you're familiar with with uh, the syntax and and getting it to work, then you can see, okay, well, here's the browsers. 
every browser behaves a little bit differently. So if you're doing um, a line content or a background image, what actually happens in the browser, and you've laid that out like where this will trigger layout, this will trigger paint, this will trigger composite, so I, th I think that's a great tool. There are other tools that you would recommend in addition to that for, for gauging uh, web, web performance? I think um, web page test is, is a staple for many, many yeah. people. The fact that they can pop in a URL, choose where in the world it loads from, um, and the device, and so on. Uh, that's incredibly useful when you're just saying, what's it going to be like if I load this thing from this place in the world where I don't happen to be sat right now, and I don't have anybody to to you know, actually test. Um, so web page test is always incredibly useful. DevTools, as I said, um, there are yeah references like uh, can I use and CSS triggers and, and whatever else where you can just be like, okay, in theory, what should happen? Um, and then I'm, I'm working on with uh, a few folks from, from Google, we're working on Lighthouse, um, which is uh, a tool that we're making that helps people, or at least we hope, uh, to understand how they're doing on progressive uh, web apps and not just sort of um, the manifest and service worker. We do some checks there. We just say, yeah, you look like you're going to be able to work offline. But we do a lot of uh, performance metric tests, and we're trying to expand that at the moment. Uh, Accessibility to do. as well. There was uh, yeah. color contrast tests on there as well. Yeah. So I, I asked Rob Dodson, because um, I got a couple of tests in there, and I said, look, Tell me which ones are the, the, the big hitters from your point of view. Like, if I could only drop in another five this morning before... Actually, it was I was in the States because I was, I was just about to go um, across for Google I.O., as in I sat in the office about to walk across, and I was like, I think Paul Harris is going to show Lighthouse this afternoon. Let's chuck in some more accessibility tests. Which ones do you want in there? But I keep saying this to, to folks about, about Lighthouse. There are so many things that we could test, and I would love to see us test and just have com a total breadth of things, and that's performance, accessibility, um, about sort of best practices on, you know, not just the manifest and, and, and that kind of thing, but there's things in there that I think we can try to codify for other developers. And so saying, oh, you're using that deprecated thing. We'd much rather you didn't use the deprecated thing. We should, we think you should be using this thing instead, and I'd love it if Lighthouse could start to surface some of those things for people. So, I think there are, basically there are a number of number of initiatives that people have got on uh, outside of Google as well. Um, yeah, I'd like to get like yeah. for some of some of our stuff here. I'd like to get some some stuff we could put into the build to do like on the command line, and I know Lighthouse is going to be on the command line, uh, or it is already. Uh, there's, I've been using the Chrome uh, plugin just just to be, you know, just for just so it's easier. I can just quickly go to pages, but but like um, there's there's projects like SiteSpeed.io, which will take a lot of APIs and sort of piece them together to go through, um, because I know like Google has the um, you know the mobile, you know, to test make sure your your pages are mobile friendly, uh, which is good to help help performance, um, not necessarily directly, uh, but indirectly for sure. And there's, um, you know, the the page test. Uh, I forgot what it's called. Page, uh, page speed insights. Yeah, page speed insights. Yeah. Um, and those, I think, those are both, or at least page speed insights is, in uh, sitespeed.io. Um, so it would be nice to have a tool that kind of goes through the different uh, testing mechanisms, like like Lighthouse, like the, you know, if if um, Microsoft has something they use, and kind of sort of see like you know, what, get to get a broader idea of the things that you may care about are not necessarily in that, you know, like they, Lighthouse may not care about something that SiteSpeed Insights or page, PageSpeed Insights cares about as much, that sort of thing. So the, the, the good news, I suppose, um, and I am, I'm, I've managed to get this far without actually trying to sell my own tool, um, but the good news is you can actually, uh, as of, I think, last week, uh, landed a patch that lets you write your own custom tests for Lighthouse. So if there is stuff that you actually nice. want to um, run a test for, you basically can require in Lighthouse, um, make your own audits, and run it, and then spit it out into the, the report, and you'll get, you can have your own custom Lighthouse report for things that you care about. So long as 
uh, so what we what we use under the hood is, is the uh, Chrome debugging protocol. So so long as Chrome can uh, surface it to you in the debugging protocol. So if DevTools knows about it or records it in some way, um, you can you can grab it. So for example, the fact that we um, know we try and get the the viewport to see whether you're mobile friendly, we we do all that querying of the page through the DevTools protocol. So um, it's there's a there is actually a link you can I think if you just sort of Google it, it will bring it up. There's like a reference for all the debugger protocols and. It's it's amazing the amount of stuff that I just did not know existed before I went to there. It's like you can activate a service worker from there. You can query the activated service workers. You can ask it to get you the manifest for for on you know on your behalf. You can ask it to do execute some JavaScript in the page. You know you, you've got uh, that control. Obviously, it's um, dependent on you launching Chrome with the port open so that you can actually connect to it and do everything else, but it basically that, that's kind of how we do it. So there are loads of ways that you could could go, but I think that's definitely for people who are you know, right at the kind of, they know what they want to achieve and what their goals are, and they're just looking for a way to actually freshly make that work, so. Um, yeah, the debugging protocol yeah. is really deep, and it's really awesome. We've talked about it on the show before, um, and just how much you can actually get done with it if you really want to, if you really want the metrics out and sort of test what you want to test. Like, it's very, very, very powerful stuff. And and Lighthouse's own GitHub as well, we should point this out. You can go and there's tickets and you can make pull requests and all kinds of things on there. So if you're out there and you want to work on something cool, Lighthouse is on GitHub. Yeah, and if you decide to watch the project, just make sure you have a lot of bandwidth to read a ton of emails. <laughs> but yeah, I think you guys have been yeah. doing a kick, kick job on this stuff. You guys have been pumping out stuff. We're very talkative, and that's only the stuff that's on the issues. I mean, in person, we talk uh, a terrific amount because you know there's a lot to discuss. You know, um, when you're trying to, because we're trying to build something that is gonna is in what it's trying to do. Um, you know, and I would love for it to, to be helpful to people. And I actually am hearing stories from people on Twitter and so on where they're sort of saying that they've used uh, Lighthouse. It has helped them kind of do very well in certain areas, and, and so that's good. So I'm, I'm pleased about that. So it's just yeah, more of the same. But you're right. You do need a lot of bandwidth to keep up with the, uh, the incessant communication from uh, the team. We do like talking. You can always turn it off in your GitHub uh Setting. Or or just Why not sleep. Why, you, Why is anybody sleeping? Stop Why sleeping. Oh no, 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 sleep more. I love sleep. Sleep's the best. I um. I used to too, and then I had I, three I, kids, and, I, and then just sleep was off. All bets were off. Yeah, so I became. I, I had that with my two. Uh, so we we are over yeah. a, a little bit, um, about ten minutes. So I really appreciate you you coming on. Is there is there other stuff that we're missing though? Like. Do we need to talk about, um, you know, the the millisecond issues? Um, where we can definitely need to know where we can find more information about Rail because I, we didn't really discuss that as much as the web performance piece. But yeah, I think there's there's a couple of things I, I, I think are worth pointing out. One is that I would really strongly suggest that um, you people avoid micro benchmarking and micro optimization. This this is a, a perennial discussion. The reason I emphasize user flows and the reason Rail for me is an important thing is it helps you choose the things that matter most to the people that you're building for. When you understand what it is they're trying to do and you work back from there, kind of going this for loop is faster than this while loop or you know if I call this API 10,000 times, unless you're calling it 10,000 times, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. Those aren't the things to pursue. Um, and when you say it to people that way, they kind of go, of course, yeah, you know, it makes sense. Um, but so often I will be asked, you know, which is faster, esoteric situation A or esoteric situation B? And I'm like, I don't know, but I think you could test it and find out. And I would suggest that that's, that's something else. Get familiar with the tools. Definitely look on developers.google.com slash web slash performance or slash web slash fundamentals performance. 
we have basically a lot of guidance there from Ilya about the networking side of thing. Uh, he's got a Udacity course on that, which is about critical render path and just getting things on screen quickly. There's another course by me um, which talks you through the process of how the browser does all those parts of the pipeline, like styles and layout and paint and blah, 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 what they all mean and how you can use the timeline to actually dig into what it's, what it's telling you and, and get to the bottom. Timeline is my favorite tool by a, a mile on, in Chrome DevTools, and it's incredibly powerful uh, once, you've, once you get past these scary rectangles and you get into that. And I would say have a look at the Udacity course have a look at that uh, the performance section on Web Fundamentals, uh, and they will it will guide you through that whole process. And it is worth your time. It's not something that's like, oh, this is nice in theory. It really will help you see, oh goodness, I'm doing that thing, that thing that's ringing the, the alarm bells in my head that I shouldn't do if I want my users to actually enjoy the thing I'm building for them. We we need to get some links to those Udemy courses. They sound pretty good. Yeah, I can. I will ping you some links shortly. So thank you for coming on. If people want to find you, harass you, uh, not harass you, but to find you and learn more about Rail um, and web performance in general, um, I recommend that they they buy Ilya's book and buy your course. But <laughs> but uh, if you they don't want to find you, where are you, you on, uh, on the yeah, don't have the Twitters? I am the Twitters, yes. Uh, I'm on the Twitters. Um, they don't have to pay for the course, by the way. Um, you don't have oh, to nice. pay for the... So that's, that's uh, and it's just something, it, if you go fast, you can do it in a day. Um, if you go less fast, it, it will take longer. But um, Aero Twist, A-E-R-O Twist on, uh, on Twitter. And, yeah, basically, I, often people go, can I email you? And I sort of say, you can, but I think as you discovered <laughs> emailing me about this, you, you can wait an awful long time, at least months, and then I come back and going, I may, I may as well make a template for it now that just says, I just hit reply, and it should just say, I'm so sorry for the delay. You know, because that is that is pretty much how my inbox works these days. But at, least, at least you get back eventually, though. Like, uh, yeah. I've had people just not get back to me, and that's worse, I think. I said I'm I, sorry, I, Eric. I said I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. I'm still mad at you. Uh, he's so angry about it. Unbelievably angry. Yeah. I think um, at some point we're going to have to have uh, somebody from Polymer come on and talk about purple. Uh, yeah, because we didn't even get into purple, did we? Um, no, not really. I no. meant there's so much, <laughs> so much we can <laughs> talk about. Another topic. Oh, it's a shame. Shame. You want to learn more about what's coming on next on the Web Platform Podcast? Follow us on Twitter at at the Web Platform, or on Google Plus and YouTube at plus the Web Platform. We also need your help in creating transcripts of the episodes and helping to create open source projects under our GitHub organization. Contact Eric Isaacson at E. Isaacson or Danny Blue at D underscore Blue. That's D-E-E underscore B-L-O-O. Thank you for listening, everybody, and we'll catch you all next week.